We praise you, Father God. We praise you, Jesus. You are a God who is actively working all around us, in us, even when we don't see it. Help us to recognize this and, ex and to accept this. You are a God who meets us where we are, and thank you for that. For the next few minutes, we pray, Lord, that you free us of any distraction. We ask Holy Spirit to reveal the truth of your word to our hearts as we read, listen, and dwell on John chapter 5. Teach us, purify us, mold us, sanctify us, love us tenderly. We pray for the men who may not be able to join us today. Free their schedules so that they may join. And we pray, Father, for those three names that we've written down. Give us the opportunity and appoint a time for us to share how you, in your goodness, have interacted with us in this study so far. As you lead, provide the perfect opportunity, the divine appointment to testify of your goodness and to invite them to the study here in Tampa, in another city, state, country, or even online. We pray that we may all continue to point others to who you are and what you've done and the life that is found in you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, men, open up your Bibles. John chapter 5. I have three divisions tonight. And my aim is Jesus' deity establishes his authority. So Jesus' deity establishes his authority. Now, deity, uh, some people may not be familiar with that word, but uh, you could look at deity as divine nature or character, or one could say, you know, a, a godness quality, right? Uh, divinity or a quality or state of being God. So Jesus' divine nature establishes his authority. Jesus' divine character establishes his authority would all be equivalent. Now for that, uh, I was thinking, and my oldest son, he's born in a Philadelphia hospital, and for that sole fact, he is, and make no doubt about it, a Philadelphia Eagles fan. I don't know how this has happened, because I grew up a Giants fan, my wife's from Houston, she's a Texans fan, and I don't know what it is, I think there's something in the water there, or they must have injected him with something while he was in the hospital, but this boy who left the area when he was barely 24 months old, he's an Eagles fan. And we'll learn tonight that Jesus is also an Eagles fan. Oh, I don't think my son's been messing with my lecture again. <laughs> Sorry, guys. No, 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 wait, I read that all wrong. It's all Eagles fans actually need Jesus, I think, is what I meant to write. No, 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 let me try that again. Okay, guys, no, make no mistake about it. Jesus is the Son of God. And with all the authority and power that comes from it. And that's what we'll be looking at tonight. Jesus' deity establishes his authority. So I have three divisions tonight. And division one is John chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. Jesus heals a lame man on the Sabbath. So turn with me. I'm going to be reading from the NIV. John chapter 5. Let's start. Uh, let's look at verses 1 to 6. Uh, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonna uh, colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Now, it's noted here in verse 3 that there were so many who needed healing, but Jesus approaches this one man from the many and asks him a simple question, do you want to get well? In verse 7, the man's response is recorded and instead of a yes or a no answer, which is what we would expect to such a question, we get a response that seems to indicate the condition of his heart and gives us a little clue as to the spiritual condition of the man. Now, the man doesn't directly answer the question of, do you want to get well, but seems to offer a reason as to why he hasn't received healing. 
Pick up with me verse 7. So it says, verse 7, the response of the man to Jesus. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me in the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Hmm. From the response, we get a slight sense of the man's hopelessness and dejection. And Jesus replies in verse 8, uh, then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now, Jesus, hearing the man's response, issues an instruction to the man. One that the man can choose to either follow or not. It's his decision, right? And we pick up in verse 9. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. Now this is an amazing sign and a supernatural work completed by Jesus. A man who's been crippled for 38 years, dejected, hopeless, encounters Jesus, is selected by Jesus, and is physically healed. Now most of us would, you know, just rejoice at that work, right? It is a miraculous work. And as we read through the verse, uh, the second part of verse 9, it says, the day on which this took place was a, ha uh, was a Sabbath. And for most of us, we really wouldn't dwell on that part, right? We wouldn't make much of that. But it's interesting that it's noted here, and we'll read as we continue on in verse 10, that this becomes quite a bit of an issue of the time. So verse 10, And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The, man, the law forbids you to carry your mat. Time out. Time out here. Flag on the play. Let's get an instant replay on this one. We need an official review. It's like someone call up Mike Pereira. But, you know, this is a great miracle, you know, but one we may have to disqualify, right? According to the rule book of the Jewish leaders, right? So if we look back at this, the Pharisees of the time had created about 39 different uh, pr uh, prohibitions of work on the Sabbath. Uh, I got a whole list of 39 here. I, I found it on the Orthodox Union website, but I'm not going to go through the entire list, but it starts with carrying, it gets into reaping, planting, uh, weaving, uh, tanning, tanning as in skins, uh, marking, kneading, so it gets really detailed, and as you click into each one, it starts to define what is work and, and not. In fact, it goes so far as to detail, you know, what you're allowed to carry inside your house or not. So it's interesting that, that some of the uh, Pharisees had really defined this, and the goal that they were aiming for uh, in observing uh, the spirit of the law of the Sabbath was for not transgressing God's holiness. But unfortunately, they fell short in thinking that it's these rules and following them that in and of itself created in them righteousness. Let's continue on. Let's look at verses 11 to 13. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. It's interesting here to consider the difference in response of this man to that of the Samaritan woman from John chapter 4. It's curious that the man's responses to the Jewish leaders, right? This is a man who had been healed after being lame for 38 years. You know, for me, I put myself in that situation I, and I wonder, hey, Tom, how would I react after, you know, being an invalid for 38 years? And what would my response have been? You know, the man's response here to this miraculous healing and the answer to the Jewish leaders, to me personally, seems to be a bit puzzling. And it leads one to ask, even though this physical issue was resolved for this man, was that the true issue, right? And it leads me to ask, was there something in his heart? Now, the man's response is very factual, right? He's, he's covering what happened, but it seems to be missing a bit of his personal testimony 
uh, of his experience and encounter with Jesus. Or maybe he, that's all he felt, right? It was just, hey, this is what happened, and this is the impact. Now, whatever it is, this man was chosen by Jesus among many there who desired and needed healing. And we don't have an explicit statement, but the response of the man seems to indicate that there is something more required and there is something more to come. And, and we read that as we continue on in this account. So let read with me John 5 verses 14 to 15. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. So the recorded point that, uh, that Jesus sought the man out and made these statements seems to indicate the need for repentance and redemption in the man's life, even though his physical issue had been solved. And this brings me to my first principle, which is Jesus has the authority to heal and the power to offer life. Jesus has the authority to heal and the power to offer life. Now, men, there are times, uh, I would say, in my, in my life that I've asked the Lord for healing, and the answer uh, that God provided at that time was not what I wanted or what I expected. And the biggest example of this in my life was the decline of my father's health uh, between October 2018, leading to his death in June of 2019. Over the period of about two to three months, uh, we as a family experienced the decline and to total failure of his body, of my uh, father's body, and also his mind as he experienced dementia. I mean, from that time, so many images and memories come to mind. Uh, me sitting at the dialysis center three times a week as, uh, as he was also on dialysis at that time. Uh, there were no less than four CT scans within like a two to three month period, um, five uh, procedures. I don't even know how many hospital admissions. I lost count on that, including a cardiac stent. And then at the end of all that, receiving the diagnosis, you know, after we spent all that time trying to understand what was going on, that it was late stage cancer. And from the date of that uh, diagnosis, over the period of just uh, three weeks, I witnessed the, and experienced the total decline and failure of my father's body as he succumbed to cancer. Now, though physical healing uh, from the Lord's hand wasn't provided at that time, uh, we clearly saw the Lord's hand of provision and healing that occurred, and those images are still with me. Um, it was really through that time that I learned to rely on the Lord for strength, moment by moment by moment. And in this case, it proved that the Lord, even in physical death, was still proven faithful in my life. And truthfully, uh, my prayers were not answered in a way I saw fit or in a way I saw fit for my father who passed away at the age of 73, but the Lord answered my prayers and I experienced his peace, his provision, and God's compassionate and unfailing love. May God be glorified. Now the truth is that Christ has the authority to heal, but a common lie that we hear in the world today is that enough faith is required to bring that physical healing. Life is full of disappointment and pain. And for some people, that may seem even harder than it is uh, for others. And we may pity those less fortunate than ourselves while secretly believing that their problem is a lack of faith. And we, pres and we presume it's God's will that he will heal all those who have enough faith and, the phys and that physical suffering is their biggest problem. But men, I tell you today that that may not be the case. It may not be the physical. That's the issue. A few questions from that, a few application questions. What long-term issue or circumstance has you crippled right now? And I ask, will you look to Jesus for help? Not solely seeking him for physical relief, 
but for life and wholeness in him in the circumstance. And you may challenge me and you say, well, Tom, that's easy for you to say. You don't know the pain that I have, the, dis uh, you know, the distress that I'm feeling. But you know what, men, even if I don't know, Jesus knows. And just like he approached that man who had been lame for 38 years, who he asked, do you want to get well? Jesus knows you. He knows your situation. And he's calling you to himself. And I ask you, man, I can't answer this for you. How is Jesus instructing you? You know, just like he instructed to the man, uh, he instructed the man to say, get up, pick up your mat and walk. But how is Jesus instructing you in that issue? And let me ask, men, what problems or challenges can you trust God to know the best and provide an answer for? And how does knowing and accepting that Jesus has the authority to heal and power to provide you hope and healing change your current situation? Jesus has the authority to heal and the power to offer life. Okay. Division 2, John chapter 5, verses 16 to 30. Jesus claims his authority and equality with God the Father. Let's pick up with uh, verses 16 and 17. So verse 16. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. Uh, one commentary I read uh, put it very succinctly, and I'll just uh, read it here because it's easy. Nonetheless, Jesus does not defend himself by getting into a rabbinical discussion on the topic of work. Rather, Jesus claims he is working just like, uh, just like God. It's interesting. If we look at the Synoptic Gospels, uh, I'll give you guys some references for that, uh, which covers this. Uh, you can uh, write down Matthew chapter 12, verses 8, um, Mark chapter 2, verses 28, and then Luke 6, verse 5. Uh, we see that Jesus, the Son of Man, is also declared to be the Lord of the Sabbath. When we look at verse 18, as we pick up, for this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling uh, God, his own father, making himself equal to God. Like I said a few weeks ago, how dare you, Jesus? And this is a good point to talk about our doctrine this week. Our doctrine is God the Father. And we see in our bridge to doctrine, when pressed by the Jewish religious leaders, Jesus offered a testimony and witness that confirmed his equality with God the Father. The Father and the Son work in absolute harmony in all things. So, a few things about the doctrine here. Uh, the Father, uh, Son, and the Holy Spirit comprise the three yet one uh, Godhead. The mystery and beauty of this divine union exceeds human comprehension, but we could try to understand it based on what the Holy Spirit teaches us. Now, the Bible reveals many things about the nature and the character of God the Father. God the Father orchestrated, as we learned, uh, the creation of the world in cooperation with God the Son and God the Spirit. And we cannot fully know or understand God the Father without looking to his Son who came to earth to reveal uh, him in, to humanity. Everything we learn about Jesus Everything we learn about Jesus helps us to be better understand what God the Father is like. And sin's, interest, uh, and sin's entrance into the world created a barrier between sinful humans and holy God. And it's only through salvation in Christ that we can experience the fellowship with God the Father that we were created to enjoy. Now, when I don't believe that I can know God the Father through his Son, I live my life missing the greatest blessings, uh, a blessing ever known. Furthermore, the news gets bad here, I face eternity separated from my Creator forever. I do not recognize God's ongoing involvement in this world or experience his unconditional love for me, even though it's there. Now, when I do believe that I can know God the Father through faith in his Son, Every day, every day represents an opportunity for me 
to enjoy fellowship and recognize God's lavish goodness to me. I see God not as an angry judge or a distant being who is cold, but intimately, but a God who's intimately involved in my life, and I experience his love, I live secure in his refuge, and face eternity with joyful expectation. Now let's flip back to verse 18 here. So verse 18, for this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling uh, God his own father, making himself equal with God. So what, are the, what is the response here? It's not one of ex, uh, acceptance, is it? But we see people starting to entrench in their position, um, not seeking the truth, but by suppressing the truth. And we'll see more of that as we continue on in this study. So that by their own actions, their own false glory may be preserved, right? Similar to the healed man who did not see Jesus for who he was immediately after the miraculous sign, the Jewish leaders seem to have the same issue. Jesus continues to, di to dissect the position that the Jewish leaders hold on to. Read with me uh, verses 19 to 23. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly I tell you, the Son of Man can do nothing by himself, he can, only, uh, he can do only what his, he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father uh, who sent him. Wow. What a beautiful picture of the Trinity and the unity and the union between God the Father and God the Son. Now, what's the result of this? This is not some philosophical or theoretical debate uh, on some clandestine point. What's at the core here, the nature, the character of Jesus is at the very core of this issue. Who is Jesus? And a lot of times in the discussions that we may have with people in the world around us who may not be believers, that becomes the core issue. Who is Jesus? And Jesus expounds on this. Let's consider what's at stake. Read, with, uh, read on with me, verse 24 to uh, 27. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and, now has, uh, com and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. So we see this phrase very truly. So uh, as, as we look at this, there are more than 20 times in the Gospel of John that Jesus uses this phrase very truly. And it can be seen as a form of a solemn address, as if Jesus is saying, pay attention to this. What I'm about to say is very important. And I love verse 24. I, I call it the crossover verse. So hallelujah, hallelujah. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and, not be, uh, and will not be judged but has crossed over from, light, from death to life. Believe in the words of Jesus and believe in the one who sent Jesus. What is that result uh, in men? Say it with me. Eternal life. Say it with me, men. What is that result in? Uh, eternal life. Thanks be to God. They will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Let's read on. John chapter 5, verses 28 to 30. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, 
and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and, in my, ju uh, and my judgment is just, for I seek not m to please myself, but him who sent me. I want to pay special attention to verse 30. Verse 30, I would say, is a very dense verse. And if we tease it apart, we get a full description regarding judgment in Jesus. Uh, I noted here six points, and I'll, I'll read those off to you. So first, we see that Judge Jesus is sent by God the Father. Second, we see Judge Jesus is acting with God the Father. Third, we read that Jesus judges only as he hears. Four, we read that Jesus' judgment is just. Five, Jesus' judgment is not self-serving. And then six, Jesus' judgment pleases God the Father. So I challenge you, men, look at that. All uh, packed into the verse 30 there. And this brings me to my second principle. Jesus, in union with God the Father, has the authority to give life, to judge, and receive honor. So I was thinking about this. I, I shared a, uh, what some may say a, a, a bit of a sad story about the passing of my dad. But as I was thinking about this unionship between Jesus and God the Father, I started thinking about my years as a teenager growing up in my dad's house. And I do mean those words very seriously. And a lot of things that came to mind is the amount of things that my father and I disagreed on, upon. There are many different things that we parted ways on, disagreed on, you know, got into plenty of arguments about. I remember one of the arguments would be on what time I would get up Saturday mornings as a teenager to mow the lawn. I preferred rolling out of bed around noon or one o'clock on Saturdays while my dad wanted it done before 9 a.m. Another uh, pretty contentious topic of debate was what I wore to church. He was more formal, typically wearing a three-piece suit or a jacket at, at the very least, and I was more casual. And then, let's not get into haircuts. Well, men, you gotta use your imagination here. This is back when I actually had hair. But when I was younger, living in New York, fades were all the rage, right? Cutting it really short or right to the skin on the side there. And my dad hated that, right? And my dad would cuttingly joke after viewing my close cuts that how back in India, that's how they identified prisoners, right? With shaved heads. <laughs> but I was thinking about that as an illustration and I was thinking about you know, how far apart my dad and I were on a lot of those topics. But that's not the case with God the Father and his son Jesus. You know, in this relationship, we have a perfect a holy union, a oneness that we can only approach to understand in fullness as we approach eternity with the help and illumination of the Holy Spirit. The Father and Jesus are one. Jesus, in union with God the Father, has the authority to give life, to judge, and receive honor. So a few applications, men. How willingly do you submit to Jesus' authority? And how does the authority given to Jesus by God the Father challenge your thinking? How does this fact encourage your heart? And how does Jesus' just judgment impact how you view those who are not walking in life with Christ? All right, men. So division three, let's see here, time check, 720, not bad. So uh, division three, John chapter five, verses 31 to 47, Jesus cites uh, conforming witnesses to his divine nature and authority. In the remaining 17 verses, Jesus lists four witnesses to his divine nature and his authority. The notes uh, this week, I, I felt, did a wonderful job uh, calling these out. So we see four witnesses. First is the witness of John the Baptist in John chapter 5, verses 33 to 35. Then we see the witness of Jesus' own works called out in John chapter 5, verse 36. Then we have the witness of God the Father in uh, verses 37 to 38. And then finally, we have the witness of the scriptures, 
verses 39 to 47. So read with me, men. Let's look at verses 37 to 40. And the Father who sent me has himself testified uh, concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. You do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. In these verses here, especially in verses 38 to 40, we see a lack of belief, a refusal to come to Jesus, a rebellion, a rejection of Jesus. And what does that lead to? A rejection of life. Man, I have a pretty challenging question to ask you, and it's actually a question that I ask myself, and uh, it hurts sometimes. But I ask you, men, as you study the scriptures, what is it that it's producing in your life? And be warned, men, it's not the study of the Bible that saves us. Just like with faith, it's the object of the study that saves us, right? It's the object of the Bible that saves us. It's Jesus that saves us. Jesus saves. So be very cautious, men. And I challenge you, men. I come to you as someone who grew up in the church, right? It's so easy. It's so easy to get distracted or go on a certain path here, very much like these Jewish leaders. They had forgotten and lost the object of what the law and the scriptures and what everything pointed to. So I challenge you, men, what is the product of the study of the word in your life? Is it a desire to serve God in humility? Is it one that seeks to point others to Jesus and the redemption that he provides? As we read, uh, read on, we, we read about the condemnation that Jesus um, uh, calls out to the leadership. We see that in 40 to 47. Pick up with me in verse uh, 41 uh, as we look at the next few verses. So 41 to 44. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes, uh, uh, that comes from the only God? Now, in the response of the Jewish uh, leaders to Jesus, um, we note, that they reject the divine nature of Jesus. The relationship of God uh, to, uh, of Jesus to God the Father as God's holy and sent Son, His dispatched Son, um, they reject the authority of Jesus and seek not God's glory, but a, uh, but a glory that's given by man, seeking to glorify each other. Let's read on in John chapter 5, verses 45 to 47. But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? The very thing that the leaders of that time upheld as their source of righteousness will be the very thing that condemns them. And this brings uh, us to our third and final principle for tonight. The truth about Jesus and his authority exposes the true condition of our human hearts. The truth about Jesus and his authority exposes the true condition of our human hearts. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity writes this, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. The truth about Jesus and his authority exposes the true condition of our human hearts. So a few application questions, men, as we close. How has Jesus expo exposed the true condition of your hearts? And how does seeking God's glory 
over the glory that comes from man change how you view a current situation or a current issue in your life. Now, as we close uh, uh, the lecture for tonight, we see Jesus clearly makes his claim to be God's son. Jesus is one with the Father, and we get a glimpse into the three-in-one Godhead of the Trinity. And I, want, and I leave you men with John chapter 5, verse 24, one of my favorite verses, the crossover verse. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, and he will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Along with the scathing warnings made by Jesus uh, to the leaders in verse 44 of how, how can you believe since you accept glory from uh, one another but do not seek glory from God. May these words bless you men and I, I pray and I hope that this points you to how Jesus' deity establishes his authority. So let us pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, thank you for this time today. In you and by accepting your holy and divine words, we have the means to cross over from death to life, to escape judgment, and to enjoy, and to enjoy eternity with you forever in sweet fellowship. Lord, that eternity starts now for all who call upon you as Savior. Be with us tonight as we dismiss uh, to our group discussions. May our discussions be with uh, may our discussions with our fellow men be transparent, rich, and glorifying to you. Uh, help us, Father, uh, to continually pray for those three men that we have written down. We pray that your Spirit continue to prompt us to pray for them, and we pray that you work in their hearts now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.